Sunday night, and we're back to the subject of prophecy and the end of time. Now, I'm 69 years old, and I've been hearing about prophecy for the last 65 years since I was a little bitty kid. And I heard my father try to preach it, and some of the preachers he knew, and they preached something called a pre-trib rapture. That means a pre-tribulation taking of the saints out of the world. That's what it means. And it never made sense to me at all. Uh, the word rapture, let me give it to you out of, I believe in the rapture, but not in a pre-trib rapture. The word rapture is the state of being carried away with joy, love, or ecstasy. An expression of great joy or pleasure. A carrying away or being carried away in body or spirit. Now, the Bible says that we're going to be carried away one day to meet the Lord in the air. And I want to review a little bit of what we have said. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians. And the problem is, is pre-trib rapture. The man that brought this to America was a man named J.N. Darby. J.N. Darby. And he brought this doctrine of pre tribulation rapture being carried away to meet the Lord in the air he brought that to America about it, it became popular he brought it here about 1836 and all through the 1800s it was propagated by a man named C.I. Schofield when you see the Schofield Bible, that man propagated it more than anybody else. And I don't like C.I. Schofield. I've got a Schofield Bible somebody gave me when I was about 19 years old. And I have never really used it when I found out what this man did. And I don't believe in his notes. Don't ever look at his notes. You can't trust him. You can't trust most notes in most Bibles. We're not talking about the Bible itself. We're talking about the notes that they add, the side notes, and so forth. Jan Darby started this, and he brought it over because in England, in England, during one of his crusades, a young girl stood up, and she said, I have a prophecy. Jesus is going to come back before the tribulation and rapture his people out or take them out to meet him in the air. The Bible has many times, it shows us that we're going to be taken out, but I keep saying the problem is the time element. Time element. I've never heard anyone in my life talk about the time element of being carried out to meet the Lord in the air. And what it takes to find out what the time element is is definition of words and reading the Bible where it says certain things. And here in First Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Asleep was a term used for believers who had died in the Lord. Jesus said to the apostles in the 11th chapter of John, Lazarus sleepeth. They said, well, if he's asleep, he'll be all right. And he turned to him and looked at him and plainly said, Lazarus is dead. He's a believer. Jesus never raised anybody from the dead that had died and gone to hell. Uh, the scripture says in the 16th chapter of Luke that the man who dies and goes to hell cannot come out of hell. People who talk about they can't come out of hell and go to heaven. Uh, there was a certain rich man there in the 16th chapter of Luke, a certain rich man was arrayed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And the Bible says that, and there was a certain beggar that had laid at his gate, and uh, he was, uh, the beggar 
was uh, had sores all over his body, and the dogs came and licked him. Did I say the rich man? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, and there was a certain, you knew what I was talking about, didn't you? Correct me. Uh, and Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores, and the dogs came and licked his sores. And the rich man died, and people say, where do you go when you die? The Bible tells you exactly where you go. The rich man died, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. He cried, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. And Lazarus died and was carried to Abraham's bosom. And Father Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Besides this, there's a great gulf fixed. And the word gulf is the word chasma, C-H-A-S-M-A. It means a separation fixed. A separation is fixed or it is set. Now, the word death is the word thanatos or thanos, T-H-A-N-A-T-O-S. And thanatos, according to certain of the scholars, means separation, not annihilation. And we do not believe that Jesus died for everybody. We believe he died or was separated from God on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And at that moment is where he suffered the shame and paid the price for the sins of all the elect of all time. Not of everybody. Jesus did not die for everybody. He did not love everybody. He loved his predestinated elect family. The Bible says so. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her in Ephesians 5.25. He only loved his wife, so only died for his wife. The man in hell is being separated from God for his own sin. And he says there's a great gulf fixed. <coughs> and the rich man said in hell, he said, send Lazarus or send someone back from the dead that they can tell my five brothers about this awful place. And Father Abraham said, no. He said, those that are there cannot come hence, and those that are here cannot go thence. Those that are there can never come here. So when these people come up and say, well, I died and went to hell. There's a knucklehead on TBN from time to time, and he talks about how he died and went to hell. If you died and went to hell, you stay there. They ain't no coming back out of it and then getting saved and going to heaven and say, Hey, uh, hey, Apostle Paul, I died and went to hell one time, but I finally got saved and came to heaven because God brought me back from the dead. God doesn't resurrect heathen vessels of wrath fitted for destruction from the dead. You go to hell, you're there forever. Now, I don't know what got me to this. Oh, let's go back. Oh, that's... <coughs> we're talking about those that sleep in Jesus. Lazarus... You got two Lazarus in the Bible. You got a Lazarus and a Lazarus. Lazarus is in the 16th chapter of Luke. And Lazarus, U.S., is in John the 11th chapter when Jesus raises that Lazarus from the dead. It is a, Lazarus is a short form of Eliezer is what it is. Now, we're looking at the time factor and time element of the Lord carrying us away to be with him. He says, But I wouldn't have you ignorant concerning those believers that are asleep in Jesus, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. That means to excessively sorrow when someone dies. We're not like the world. We don't have to excessively sorrow over our loved ones that go to be with the Lord. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, there's two parts to you when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. There's your body laying in a grave, and then there's your spirit that goes to be with the Lord. The part of you that's asleep is over there in a the grave, and the part of you that's alive and that's feasting. Father Abraham was feasting there in heaven because that 
when it says that Lazarus died and was carried to Abraham's bosom, Abraham's bosom is a picture and a type of the feast table or the triclinium table. So uh, he was alive. I mean, unless Father Abraham was talking in his sleep when he was talking to the rich man in hell, he wasn't talking in his sleep. He was consciously talking to the rich man who had died and gone to hell. Now, he goes on to say, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also would sleep in Jesus, those spirits that are in fellowshipping with Christ somewhere. And I don't know where the somewhere is. It's out there somewhere. <laughs> will God bring with him? For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. The word coming is the word parousia, P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. Now, that means physical arrival. We which are alive and remain, remain is a word that gives you a time factor. Remain is the word P-E-R-I-L-E-I-P-O, perilipa. It means to survive some great slaughter. The church is going to be attacked and be under a slaughter. And there will no flesh be saved unless, no elect flesh will be saved unless God shortens those days. In other words, the church is, and if you stop and think, how many, how many people out of the world are going to be under this slaughter? A few. So whenever we're talking about tribulation, we're not talking about the man of sin being some great world leader that's slaughtering all the world. They're going to be slaughtering the Christians, the few. It's not going to look obvious to anybody. And we're not talking about slaughtering the Baptists and slaughtering the Church of Christ and the Pentecostals. They don't preach a message that anybody wants to slaughter them for the world system will be fine and happy with that kind of a message. It'll be people like us. We which are alive and survive, that's actually what it says, unto this physical arrival of the Lord shall not prevent, meaning to go before those which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. That's the rapture. But the rapture has to do with surviving a great slaughter. And when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, the word is kaluo, K-E-L-L-E-U-O. That is a war cry. Well, if this is a secret coming, a war cry is not being made. It's the same kind of shout when, when Joshua marched around Jericho in the sixth chapter of Joshua. He marched around Jericho seven days. And on the seventh day, he had seven priests with seven trumpets. And he marched around seven times. And... When he marched around seven times, they sounded the seven trumpets and the walls fell down and judgment came. Now, there's seven trumpets in Revelation 8, 9, and 10. And at the seventh trumpet, or the last trump, that's when we're going to be changed. Let's read it one more time over here in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm just kind of covering, doing a little bit of review time element or the time factor is what's important. The church will live into the tribulation and the church will be persecuted and slaughtered for their belief and it will only be a few of the people in the world. In verse 51, 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We will not all be dead. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, here's the time factor. Somebody wrote me and said, where is that about last trump? Here it is, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. We're going to be changed at the 
last trump. Let me say that again. At the last trump. Why did people miss that? Last is the word eschatos. When you go to a seminary and you study eschatology, you're studying end time events. Eschatos means end of something. And of course, from eschatos, we get the word echo. Echo is a Greek word. It's not a word we invented. When you go out to Grand Canyon or one of those canyons out in Arizona, northern Arizona, and you, and you shout across the canyon, you say, hello, and you get back, hello, hello, hello. That is an echo, and that is holding a sound. This word echo is the word means, it is a common Greek word meaning to hold. That's all it means. Well, Mr. Thayer in his lexicon says that the last trump is the last trumpet after which no other trumpet will sound. Well, let's read on here. We're going to be changed at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So the dead in Christ will rise first, but they will not go before us. They'll rise first, and we shall be changed at the last trump in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as I've said. An eye twinkles at something like one one-hundredth of a second. I have checked it out at one time. So we're going to be changed, a lasso, made different. At the last trump, at the last trump, at the last trump, last trump, last trump, last trump. How many times does somebody have to say that before the people out there in the world will believe that's the time factor? I've heard so many preachers quote this. We're going to be changed in a moment in the twink of an eye. Period. Wait a minute. Put the time factor in the next phrase, at the last trump. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal, these bodies that we're in, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, talking about the change, won't that be wonderful to get rid of these sinful bodies? Man, they don't... Now, you don't know it now, some of you young people, when you're trying to fulfill them, it don't give you nothing but trouble. <laughs> That's all your body gives you. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and he slept with all of them, had sex with all of them. He said, they vex me. It's vanity and vexation of spirit. I cannot fulfill my sexual desires with a thousand women. That's why men keep wanting to run around with another woman, another woman, another woman. That's why they trade wives about every two weeks in Hollywood. They can't be satisfied, can they? It's, it's a vexing thing. It's just, it makes you miserable. And as you get older, you get tired of the body and you say, I can't fulfill this body. Let me kill it off. The man that loves silver will never be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. When goods are increased, Solomon said, I got me men singers and maid dancers and all sorts of of." fruit and every kind of thing a man could want and gold and silver and he was the richest man on the face of the earth and he said it all vexes me well he that loveth silver will never be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance with increase the more you get the more you want well what do you do with an itch you can't scratch you kill it that's mortifying the deeds of the flesh that's taking your cross and dying daily I've preached on the cross and people say Oh, but that's such a miserable thing. No, it's not. You can't fulfill the flesh. These young people don't know that, but they will know it after years of bills and when Jerry's, little Jerry's another seven or eight years, he's going to be trying to pay $900 on an apartment and $175, $200 a month on a light bill and a car paying about $425 a month and insurance of $100 a month. And he's going, going well, what is this about? <laughs> My mama told me this, but, and they think it's not coming, but it'll be here very shortly, won't it? Very quick. 
And then you live your life and you go through trials and troubles and possibly a divorce or two and kids and and child support and you can't hardly live and you're trying to get the job you want and it doesn't work and you wake up at 50 and you're saying, I got to give this up or 40 or wherever God day, whatever time God deals with you to crucify the flesh. The reason you crucify the flesh is you can't fulfill it and you get tired of it. You can't, can you? So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting now? O grave, where is thy victory? And that's going to be the reward of these new bodies. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And you can't get away from these bodies. Now, let's go over here. We're verifying this. Let's go back to Revelation. We're talking about changed at the last trump. Revelation 8, 9, and 10. Revelation 8 chapter. You've got seven trumpets. Seven trumpets sounding, and I'm reviewing it for people who haven't heard it. And you can't get all this all at once anyway. Revelation 8. There's seven angels. The seven angels are the spirits of the seven churches. Angel, angelos, means messenger. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And seven comes from the word, the Hebrew word is Shabbat. And it comes from the root word, uh, it's Sheba, excuse me, Sheba. Sheba, and it comes from the word Shabbat, meaning to be completed, <coughs> meaning to be completed or to seven oneself. It means to mature. So the seven angels, there are seven angels with seven trumpets. Verse 7, the first angel sounds. Verse 8, the second angel sounds. Verse 10, the third angel sounds. Verse 12, the fourth angel sounds. Chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounds. Chapter 9, verse 13, the sixth angel sounds. And the last angel sounds in chapter 10. But here's the picture of chapter 10, and I keep saying, Revelation is not sequences of events. Revelation is the angel showing John the view from over here, and then the view from over here, and the view from over here, and the view from here. Revelation has the end of time throughout the book. The end of time is in Revelation, the sixth chapter. Revelation, the sixth chapter you find the end of time in Revelation, the 8th chapter, where we see the mountain burning, and that's Babylon. And you find the end of time in Revelation, the 10th chapter, there in verse 7. You find the end of time in Revelation, the 11th chapter. You find the end of time in Revelation, the 14th chapter, and you find the end of time in Revelation, the 16th chapter. And then you find the end of time in Revelation, the 19th chapter. The end of time is all through there. And let's look at this in Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his feet was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. This is Christ. Not going to have time to go into it. And he had in his hand a little book open. That's the same little book that... John is told to eat over there in the uh, fifth chapter. And it's the same little book here that he eats. That's uh, in this chapter in verse 10. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. When you first begin to eat of the word of God and you find out about predestination and election, it's sweet as honey and it's wonderful to you. And then you want to go tell your family and you say, my family goes to church and they'll really love this. And then you find out the second part of this verse. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. That's what happens. That's what that's talking about. Now, back to verse 2. He had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, 
And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not, and don't come to me after church and ask me what the seven thunders uttered. I do not know, because John didn't know. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, He's got one foot on the land, the other on the sea, lifts up his hand to heaven and swears by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. Is that the end of time? And then we see the last trump or the seventh trumpet sounding. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, you got these seven trumpets as we just read them. In the days of the voice of the seventh angel sounding his trumpet, the mystery of God should be complete. The word finished is the word teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. This, it's complete. The mystery of God is the church in Ephesians, the third chapter, in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. I speak unto you a mystery, and he said, I speak unto you concerning Christ and the church. That's the mystery. A mystery is something that's got the cover on it. To reveal means to take the cover off, or revelation means to take the cover off. And God only takes the cover off and reveals to his church who he is. So during the days of the voice of the seventh angel, the mystery of God or the church is complete. And that's when the angel puts one foot on the land, the other on the sea, and says time is no more, and it's all over. Boy, is this, this is serious words. And people say, Revelation is too hard a book. I hope that scares you. If something can scare you, it's not too hard to understand. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. As he hath declared to his servants the prophets... Now, that's the seven trumpets. You had seven trumpets as they marched around Jericho. And we have the shout in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, the war cry that has to be at the end of time. He's not making a war cry as he's calling the saints out to meet him in the air secretly, is he? No. Doesn't even make any sense. Last trump is the key. And people say, well, that's only in the Bible one time. Well, how many times is John 3.16 in the Bible? One time. How many times does something have to be in the Bible to be true? Once. That's all. How many things? And you can't count the things in the Bible that are just one time. Many, many, many important things. We'll make a list of those and bring them out. And look at chapter 11, verse 15. You see... Chapter 11, verse 15 is just looking at this from a different viewpoint. The seventh angel sounded, or the last trumpet sounded of the seven angels, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, to reign forever and ever, to put that twice means from now on and there'll be no enemies rise up again. Therefore, what that means is there'll be no millennium where Satan rises up at the end of the millennium. If he conquers all of his enemies at the seventh trump, and that's what this says, doesn't it? He's conquering all of his enemies at the seventh or the last trump. And the church is finished at the last trump. I've got to put this in one more time. Philippians 3. I'm reviewing the whole thing. Philippians 3, speaking of Christ. Christ shall change our vile body. He's going to change our vile body, this old sinful body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, according to the energia, E-N-E-R, G-E-I-A. We get our word energy from that. According to the operation, it means operation. The same operation that changes our bodies, he is able to subdue all things to himself. Verse 21 says the same thing 
that Revelation 10 and 7 and Revelation 11 and 15 says. Revelation 10 and 7 says the church is finished at the last trump and at the last trump we'll be taken out of here. And Revelation 11, 15 says he will conquer all of his enemies at the last trump and and, Re and Philippians 3 and 21 says that the same operation that changes our bodies will destroy all of his enemies. Right? Revela uh, Philippians 3, 21. The same operation that changes our bodies will destroy all of his enemies. Now that's key to understanding this. Because 1 Corinthians 15, I'm pitching this to you. I've put it down, but I want to put these, all these verses down on one tape. 1 Corinthians 15. He's going to conquer all of his enemies at the last trump, at the seventh trump, isn't he? Yes, sir. And that's the trumpet where the mystery of God is finished, and that's the last trump where we'll be changed, and that's not a pre-trib rapture. He says here in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. After, now, he's going to conquer all of his enemies at the sounding of the seventh trump. He's going to change our bodies at the seventh trump or the last trump. So if he conquers all of his enemies, the last enemy that he conquers will be death. So death has to be conquered at the last trump. That's at the end of time, not a pre-trib rapture, because if it was a pre-trib rapture, people are going to die all the way through the tribulation, aren't they? Well, the last half of the tribulation, three and a half years, a time times and half a times, or 1260 days, or 42 months, that's, that's the great persecution of the church. That's people dying all through that. How could there be a pre-trib rapture when people are going to be dying all through that last half of the tribulation? Do y'all really understand that part? That's, the, that's why it's so stupid to say that there's a pre-trib rapture because the seventh trumpet will change our bodies. It will be the last trump. It will conquer all of God's enemies it will conquer death. So how could there be a pre-trib rapture when men are dying all through the last seven years? The last seven years is a time of death. And how could there be a so-called millennium and then Satan rise up out here at the end of the millennium when, and he's the enemy of God when God says when our bodies are changed all his enemies will be conquered. Does it say that? We don't believe in a... Let me just show you something that puzzled me when I was a little kid. Go to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Puzzled me when my father and these guys would talk about a pre-trib rapture. He's talking about the thousand years. Now, I do not believe it's a thousand years. The word is kilia. I'm not going to go into it. Kilia. I believe it is the last 2,000 years of time. I believe it's thousands of years. It's the last 2,000. And mainly because of verse 5 of chapter 20. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the 2,000 years was finished. This is the first resurrection at the end of the 1,000 years. Not, not seven years before, that the end, before the end of the 1,000 years. At the end of the 2,000 years, from at least Acts 2 to the end, that's the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God in Christ and shall reign with him for a 1,000 years. If there's a 1,000 year reign then we won't go be resurrected and go be to, with the Lord till the end of the thousand years, would we? According to verse 5. You understand what I'm saying? If there's a millennium, and I don't believe that, and the church didn't believe that, by the way, Mr. Darby brought that to America in the 1830s too. Pre-trib rapture and premillennialism. 
And that's, uh, that's a false doctrine, and I'm not going to go into that right now. Now, let's keep verifying. Keep verifying. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. <coughs> We're going to be changed at the seventh trump or the last trump. Matthew 24, the apostles asked Jesus, What's going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus tells them, he gives them all these signs. I believe we're sitting on the verge of eternity, people. I hope so. I've never been so tired in my life. When I was 17 and 18, I was cool. I really, my father would, and some of his friends would preach the end of time. And I didn't want that to happen. I had a life to live. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to get a degree. I wanted to become somebody. I wanted to do something in my life. I wanted to do this and that. If you live life, you find out this flesh is nothing. And I'm tired of the flesh. Is anybody tired of the flesh? Boy, I'm tired of it. People in youth says, I don't understand what you're talking about. I know that. But believe me, you will in time. You will, you will know. And sometimes it ain't that far away. I've seen people that 30 years old that have been to hell and back about 10 times. Boy, when you get down a long, hard road, you're going, hey, man, this is tough. Now, in Matthew 24, he talks about, they say, what's going to be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And he goes through here and talks about uh, take heed that no man deceive you. Many will come saying that I am Christ and shall deceive many. They will not say they're Christ. They're going to say Jesus is Christ and they'll deceive. And there will be wars and rumors of wars and nation will rise against nation in verse 7. These are the beginning of sorrows. They'll deliver you to be afflicted in verse 9. And they'll kill you and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the agape, walking in the commandments of God, will wax cold. That's going on now, isn't it? And he goes on to the abomination that makes desolate. That's causing the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in the last seven years of time. And then he says, he goes on to say... In verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world. To this time, no, nor ever shall be. The worst time in the history of the world will be the end of time. And people who want to try to make this some preterism that Jesus came in the temple. No, the worst time in the history of the world will be the end of time. And he says in verse 22, and except those days shall be shortened, there shall no elect flesh be saved. That's the context here. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say, here is Christ or there, don't you believe it? He's in the, if they say he's in the secret chamber there in verse 26, he says, go not forth. He's in the desert. Don't you believe it? If some grandmother says, I saw Jesus in my bedroom and I talked to him, the Bible says she is lying. The Bible says Oral Roberts is lying when he saw a 900-foot Jesus out by his prayer tower. The Bible says that Benny Hinn is lying when he went into some Roman Catholic prayer tower and grabbed Jesus by the legs. These guys are liars and thieves and crooks. I don't like them. So he grabbed Jesus by the legs. Yeah, isn't that stupid? <laughs> He said he was in this Catholic prayer tower praying and he reached out and these legs were in front of him and it was Jesus there. Don't believe these guys. And don't believe Mickey Rooney either. Mickey Rooney is an idiot. Uh, Mickey Rooney is an old actor out of the 30s and 40s and he said, I was in a restaurant one day and this blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy came and said, I'd like to wait on you. And, and, and after he waited on us, I didn't know who he was, and I asked the manager. They said, we don't have a blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy. And he was implying that it was Jesus. Jesus ain't there. Don't care whether you're served a steak or not, whether it's rare or not, you goofball. <laughs> and they're just wanting to shine and show off and impress people. Can't believe none of that stuff. That's Pentecostalism. They like to hide. They're trying to impress people, making up these stories. It's, that's all it is. It's their imagination, isn't it? Now, 
Then he says in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So the time factor after the tribulation goes all the way to the end of this chapter. Everything is happening at the same time at the end of time. Everything that's happening after the tribulation can be in a snap of a finger. All this is showing is that when you see after the tribulation, that's the time factor here, right? <coughs> Verse 31. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet after the tribulation of those days. That's the time element. The last one hadn't sounded up to this point, has it? No. And when you get down here and you see no man knows the day nor the hour in verse 36, it's talking about that moment of the sounding of the seventh or the last trump. And when you go down here and he says, uh, verse 40, two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. The one shall be taken at the sounding of the last trump of the trumpet sounding of verse 31. So all of this can happen in a moment. Instantly, everything that happens from verse 29 after the tribulation. After the tribulation is the end of time, isn't it? That's Christ coming back on a great white steed to come back and destroy all of his enemies. And how fast does it take him to destroy? All right, man, you get that, get that spear over. Get that machine gun. Okay, fire. No, it's like step back, zap, you're all dead, it's over. Except it's going to be faster than zap. A moment, a twink of an eye. So when you see one taken and the other left, that's at the sounding of the last trump. The believer is taken out to meet the Lord in the air, right? And the other's left to suffer the vengeful wrath of the living God. Oh, what a terrible, horrible thing. You won't even want your enemies to suffer this. Not the worst enemy you ever had. People hear me talking about my little brother who's on TV and Dean Brown. He is just a fool. Don't know nothing about the Bible. And the worst dream I ever had, I raised him in my home for some years. The worst dream I ever had, I woke up one morning and I, I just felt terrible because I dreamed that Dean was, God was fixing to cast him into hell. And he was crying, he was screaming, Jimmy, tell God I didn't mean it. He thought he could ride in on my coattail. And I was so unhappy, and I am still unhappy about that. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But he says, I'll give you signs. And you're not the children of the darkness that that day should overtake as you as a thief. He says, I come as the thief in the night to those who are not watching. But I'll give you signs. When you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors in verse 33. No man knows the exact time he's coming back in verse 36. We'll read 36. But of that day and hour, the exact time knoweth no man. But in verse 33, likewise when you see all these signs come to pass, Know that is near even at the doors. You've got to keep both of those scriptures in mind. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. These verses scared me to death when I was a teenager. My, my father didn't have to comment. If he read them, I was frightened out of my mind. That's good if it scares you. The only way to scare you if you belong to God and he'll deal with your heart. It's good to be scared. That's the fear of the Lord, the Yahweh. When most people say, we're not supposed to fear God. When Moses came to the mountain, there in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, he got near to the mountain, he was frightened. The word frightened is the word ekphobeo, E-K-P-H-O-B-E-O. -E or ekphobos, O-S. It, sometimes it's spelled either way. Ek phobos, from phobos we get phobia, and ek means out. It means to be frightened out of your wits. Moses is going to talk to the living God, and he's not frightened. He's frightened out of his wits. 
That's stupid, these people say. We're not supposed to be frightened of God. We're to fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell, aren't we? Now, let's further this study. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. How much time have I taken on that? Okay, good. I've covered everything, most everything, not in detail like we've covered in previous weeks. But let's go over to 2 Thessalonians. Now this shows Christ coming back. And the time factor has to be the last trump, doesn't it? <laughs> Remember one other thing. The Jews had a religious calendar. They had a regular calendar that went from Nisan, Nisan to Nisan the next year. Their years did not start like our years and did not start in in January. Their year started in our month, March, April, and didn't start on the 1st of March or the 1st of April. It was in that time period. They had a, that was their regular year, Nissan to Nissan, March, April to March, April. March, April, March, April. to March, April. March, April. But they had a religious or an ecclesiastical calendar. And that started in Nisan and went seven straight months. It went seven straight months down to Tishri. Or Tishri, however you want to pronounce it, I don't really care. Don't matter. Tishri, which is the seventh month on the Jewish religious calendar, because during this time period, they had all their religious feast days. They started in Nisan, the first of their months, and they had on the 14th day of the first month, they had Passover. And then 50 days later, 50 days, they had Pentecost. And then when you get down to the seventh month, they have the Feast of End Gathering. That is a picture. Or the Feast of Tabernacles. And this Feast of End Gathering was to celebrate all the crop that had been gathered during that ecclesiastical seven-month year. They didn't have any holidays, any rest of the year. Just this part right here. And for seven straight months, seven. For seven straight months, they had a new moon festival. New moon. New moon festival. And at the beginning of every month, they would sound a trumpet for seven straight months. And at the end of their ecclesiastical year at the sounding of the seventh trump, all of the crops, anything remaining that was gathered in to celebrate all of the crop that was gathered in, that's like the what God's going to do at the end of time in the 25th chapter of Matthew when he says, he's going to separate the sheep from the goat, he's going to separate the wheat from the tares, at the end gathering, at the signing of the seventh trump. The last trump is the Jewish thing. It's the last trump. Last trump is the key to our being carried away to meet the Lord in the air. And there's something that's holding the church down on the ground and keeping us from going out in the air to meet the Lord in the air. In 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter tells us what that is. Let's go over there to that. 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. 2 Thessalonians. I don't know why nobody studies all these verses, but they don't. I'm just amazed at what people say. All right, 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter. Well, I'll get it in a minute. I'm turning to the wrong place. All right. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When are you coming back, Lord? 
And he says, after the tribulation of those days, he'll send his angels with the great sound of trumpet. And the word coming is the word parousia, physical arrival. When are you coming? When are you physically going to arrive? Not when you're going to come back in the air, but when you're coming back to join us in fellowship with us. Now, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, now is a conjunction. It relates what's fixing to be said to what has been said. It is a subordinating conjunction. It has to obey the previous chapter. Evidently, already he has spoken of the coming of the Lord. Well, he has done that in the previous chapter. Let's, let's back up to the previous chapter and keep this in mind. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus and by our gathering together unto him in the skies. The word gather together is the word episunagoge, E-P-I-S-U-N-A-G-O-G-E. Epi, it comes from epi, soon, and ago. Soon means with. Epi means a covering all over or a wrapping in. And ago means to lead. It means to gather together with. That's what it means. Now, this is a common word throughout the Scriptures. But first, let's back up when it says, Now, we beseech you, brethren, because this connects what's been said to what's fixing to be said. We have to back up. Evidently, he has talked about a coming of the Lord in the previous part of the first chapter, and that's exactly what he's done. Let's go back up here to, well, let's start in the first verse of 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity or the agape of every one of you all toward each other abound us, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulation. That word tribulation is the word thalipsis. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. We have to go through tribulation to get there. Acts 14, 22. That ye endure... Hupomeno, H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O. That is the verb, and the noun is hupomone, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E. That is the word patient, or patience. Patience. And the trying of your faith work of patience. And let patience have its perfect work. Let the fire continue. Don't pray for the fire to go away because that makes us what we are. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. You have to suffer for the kingdom of God to go to heaven. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation or thalipsis to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, <coughs> Thalipsis, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When you see chapter 2, verse 1, by the coming of our Lord Jesus, that's a reference back to when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Revealed, apocalypto, apo. K-A-L-U-P-T-O. Apo, a removal of the cover. And when he comes back, according to Matthew 24, 27, it will be as the lightning shines from the east to the west. I thought when I was a kid that Jesus was coming out of the east. That's not what this is saying. East to the west is around the world, isn't it? But they didn't know that, but God knew that. East to west is like so. 
It's like, here's the globe, here's the earth. And God says, okay. And he just like, like opening a can, he peels the top off and says, I'm here. And every eye shall see him. People say, but I've been hearing that all uh, my life. It ain't happened yet. There's some things that didn't happen when people were kids back in the 40s and the 30s. Israel has become a nation. It, for the first time in 2,600 years, May 14, 1948, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and led away captive into all nations until the times of the Gentile rule over and is fulfilled. And the Gentile rule has been finished over Jerusalem as of the Six-Day War of 1967, June 5th through June 10th. Those are significant dates. Now, let's go back to this. So, the, re the revelation of Christ with his mighty angels, and he tells in verse 8 how he's coming. As the lightning shines from the east to the west. That's what verse 8 is talking about. And it's talking about the same thing in Revelation 19. Here's how he comes back. Eyes is a flame of fire in Revelation 19. Remember that? Eyes is a flame of fire. He's coming back. 19. In verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he's coming back in flaming fire here in verse 8. Flaming fire is not a secret coming. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. You have to obey the gospel in order to go to heaven. You can't go disobedient to God. People say, I thought all you had to do was accept Christ. There's no such thing as accept Christ. He has to birth you by his will, and he must cause you to be obedient to him. And if he doesn't cause that in your life, you're not going to heaven. If you don't obey the gospel, gospel is euangelizo, E-U, or euangelion, E-U-A-G-G, E-L-I-O-N, comes from E-U, A-G-G, E-L-I-Z-O means a well angel. That is our word evangelize. This is our word evangelism. And you angelizo, that is the word gospel. And the gospel is the resurrection. And resurrection is the word anastasis. That means to come to life after dying, and we die daily. And that word anastasis is feminine gender. That's the church, the wife of Christ, dying daily and resurrecting daily in Christ. And if you don't take your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple, Jesus said. You're not going to heaven without a daily cross. It don't matter who you are. If you don't deny self, take your cross daily, no heaven for you. I didn't say that. God said that. Luke 14, 27. Luke 14, 32. If you do not forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. You have to have a daily cross. That is, and then you have to die and resurrect daily in Christ in order to go to heaven. That's the gospel. You have to be obedient to that somewhere in your life. That's tough words, isn't it? That's everybody. Every man, woman, and child. Somewhere that has to take hold of your life. And it's not something you will do. It's something God will do in you if you are his elect. If you can hear these words and they frighten you, you're on your way. If they don't frighten you and you're, this bores you, I just leave right now. It has to scare you. Is it scary? It scared me when I was a kid. Now, he, this is the coming he's talking about. In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the coming that he's talking about in verse chapter 2 verse 1. Who shall punish with everlasting destruction, who shall be punished. The people that do not obey the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. If you do not take a cross and die daily, you're going to be punished with everlasting destruction. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? You've got to deal with this. If you say, I don't like it and I don't agree with that, then you'll go to hell one day. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, 
to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, Thessalonians, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus. Chapter 2. Don't pay any attention to that. Never pay any attention to C-H-A-P-T-E-R 2. And don't pay any attention to where it's got little verse. It's got 1, 2, 3. In the first century, all of these were written in scrolls. And it was one long letter. And they weren't, they weren't separated into chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. It was just one long scroll and they'd open it up and read from it. So you're reading straight from the words, uh, verse 12, into the words of chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, C-H-A-P-T-E-R, is not inspired. 2 is not inspired. We're still on the same subject of Christ coming back in flaming fire. And now he says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And by our gathering together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, according to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, this is the same time factor. This is the same time factor of the last trump of Revelation 10 and 7. This is the same time factor of Matthew 24, 29. After the tribulation of those days, the Lord sends his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. This is the same time factor. This is the same event. Same event. He says that you be not soon shaken in mind nor or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. He says don't you be troubled by spirit or word nor by letter from us because Paul said I didn't write any such letter because the day of Christ is not at hand because he says two things must happen before Christ comes back. Two things. And one of them is already happening when Paul writes this. And we have to wait till the last trump, don't we? And that will be when Christ comes back in flaming fire at the end of time. And we got to be awful close to that according to the 70 weeks of Daniel that we have been preaching. I don't know if I'll see it. I believe these young people here will see the worst world that we've ever seen. The world is getting crazy. Right now, Mr. Amani Dajad in Iran, that is the old Persian Empire, he is, says that they're going to attack Israel as soon as they get nuclear warheads. Israel is saying they're going to make a preemptive strike on Iran. And they sent some planes out last year with 20 kiloton nuclear warheads and they were turned back by U.S. F. whatever they are, 15, 18 fighters. They told they would shoot them down because they're having to keep peace in the Middle East region. So the Israel fighters went back, but they were planning over there and bombing them. Benjamin Netanyahu, who was the premier of Israel a few years ago, said, we are going to attack Iran with nuclear power because Amani Dajjad says he is going to attack Israel because they stole the land that belonged to the Palestinian Arabs and all the Arabs are brothers. These are brothers to the Palestinian Arabs in 1948. They took the land away from the Palestinian Arabs who had owned the land for 400 years and gave it to Israel. 93% of the people in Israel were Palestinian Arabs and they came in and took their land and said, you move over to the Gaza Strip and move to the West Bank. We're giving this land to Israel because it was given to Israel in Genesis 12, Genesis 17, Genesis 28, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel in Genesis the 32nd chapter. We're, fixing this, we're sitting on a powder keg in the Middle East, and people don't even know that. This thing is about to blow. And what do you think is going to happen when... 
If Mr. Netanyahu is elected premier of Israel again, watch out. He is going to Iran. <coughs> Ahmadi Dajjad says he's coming over there to blow Israel off the face of the earth as soon as he gets nuclear warheads. Mr. Netanyahu says if they don't go over here and blow them up and they don't attack them, they will destroy Israel. And he says Israel has full intention. And he made the statement about six months ago. He said Iran was about two years away from nuclear warheads. And that's been six months ago. So they're going to have to attack them before two years is up. It could be in the next six months. We're headed towards the most dangerous times. And if Israel goes over here and blows Iran to smithereens with nuclear power, Israel is a world nuclear power. They've got thousands of missiles waiting to blow up all these people around here. <coughs> it's not like the reason they're... It's not like the reason they don't attack Israel is because they feel sorry for them. All of these Arab nations are afraid of Israel. They are super powerful. It's like Mighty Mouse sitting in a bunch of cats. And, then, and if they attack, that's why when, when Saddam Hussein in Iraq was launching those Scud missiles over here, and they sent a representative from the United Nations and begging Israel, don't get involved in this. Because if Israel had gotten involved in that, they would have started planting nuclear warheads over there in Iraq. And Mr. Netanyahu says, we don't have any alternative nor the choice that we're going to go over there and we're going to put nuclear warheads into Iran in the next two years. He said that six to eight months ago. So look for this to happen. I am looking for mushroom clouds in the distance. Even my cardiologist, who usually, those guys are usually very liberal thinking. He, he said, I believe we will see in America nuclear power released by terrorists. And I thought, hey, you're a smart guy. Thank you. I believe we're going to see that before it's over with. And I won't go into all the nuclear suitcases that have been sold by the Russian mafia in New York City to all of these by these Soviet agents after the break of the Soviet Union. And they've got nuclear power everywhere. And what do you think they can do out of Mexico without that fence there? And even with that fence there, do you think they can bring nuclear power across? They, they probably already got it here. And they've got nuclear suitcases that weigh 60 pounds. And they can take one of those nuclear suitcases into a building in New York City and blow up half the city with a 60-pound nuclear suitcase. <coughs> I'll tell you what would really devastate people is take a big NFL game and blow up the Pittsburgh Steelers playing the Dallas Cowboys. Whew. You think that would not just destroy the morality of America? It would shake them to their feet. You say, why a football team? America's involved in that. It's like, this is it. Blow up a Super Bowl. The morality of America would shake to pieces. I blow up Hoover Dam, <coughs> Boulder Dam out there in Nevada. And they blow that up, and you're going to end up with those grids out there that cover all the west out there, and it'll be dark out there. And there's so much they can do, and they will come across the borders. And the Arabs are upset at us for having given that land, in America particularly, and Great Britain for being behind the petitioning of the land. They've been in a jihad against us since May 14, 1948. Something's going to happen. I keep looking. I turn on the news every day. I'm looking, waiting. I was expecting it when 9-11 happened. Mary came in the bedroom. I was sleeping late as I usually do. Stay up late at night studying. She came in and shook me and said, they're, they're attacking New York City. And I, I turned over and very quietly said, well, I wonder how long it was going to take them to do that. It didn't shock me. I expected it. And when the next one happens, I am expecting it. This is called the end of time, is what it's called. Now, <coughs> let's look at this. 
No man, let no man deceive you, for that day shall not come. Which day? Our gathering together unto him, in verse 1. Christ coming back in flaming fire, in verse 8 of the previous chapter. Jesus being revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in verse 7 of the previous chapter. That day shall not come except two things happen, and one thing is already happening when Paul wrote this. Now here's the two things. The day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. Number one, the falling away has to come. Falling away. Apostasis. Apo. Stasis. Apo means the removal. And stasis means to stand upright. It comes from the base word staros, which means cross. There has been a removal of the daily cross, hasn't there? Look here, and here's why the daily cross. When you crucify self, you tell the truth, and it's not you that does the crucifying. Men will crucify you for telling them Christmas is pagan, predestination is true, Easter is pagan, death to self, daily cross, self-denial. They'll crucify you for that. Your family will crucify you. It will be a figurative crucifixion, a spiritual crucifixion, but they will do it, won't they? There has to be a falling away first. How much time do I have, Mike? Okay, look over here at Philippians. Here's what there's going to be a removal of. Philippians. The third chapter. Verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often... And now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's not talking about vessels of wrath. This book is written to God's people that are enemies of the cross of Christ. And the cross of Christ is the daily cross. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. The belly was the seat of all sensual desire. That was an Epicurean term in the first century. Whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. The reason they remove the cross is because they froneo, P-H-R-O-N-E-O. -E it means their sentiment or desires is on earthly things. Earthly is the word gay, it means Dirt or soil. They like dirt. That's why dirt. Everything's made of dirt. Their diamond ring is dirt. Their car is dirt. Their house is dirt. Their dirt. Their bank is dirt. Where they deposit their dirt money. They like dirt. They like the flesh. They don't like spiritual things. So there's a removal. And men are seeking after the things of this world. Especially in America, aren't they? This is a Babylonian system in America. So they've removed the cross, and another meaning for stasis is controversy. When you take your cross and stand upright and tell truth, it's very controversial in the world. Controversy has been removed from the churches. Well, God loves you, and He wants you to have everything that you want. He wants you to prosper and have money and be in health and have physical health. That's not our word. That word prosper is not our word prosper, and that word health is not our word health. The word prosper, you hodos, means well way. And Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the hodos. And He said, narrow is that way. Narrow is that hodos. Prosper, you hodos. And they say, I went with God, wants you to have money and things and stuff and wants you to be happy. And they preach this slush message, no cross, no death to self, no. And is that here? Paul said it was there during the day that he was writing this book. Yes. Number one, there has to be a falling away. But Paul said, that's already happening. 
Then he says, first of all, there has to be a falling away and that man of sin has to be revealed as the son of perdition. The man of sin is the head of the world beast system. Man of sin. I keep looking for some man to come along that's going to be the most charming man that the world has ever seen. I thought for a while it might be Bill Clinton. I mean, I have never seen a man, people, never seen a man charm people after he just does everything wrong. And just charm the whole world. And that ain't because I am a Republican. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I don't care about it. The man is a charmer. He really looks like the king of fierce countenance in Daniel, the 8th chapter. He looks like him more than anybody does. And boy, he sure is a charmer, isn't he? He's going to run Bill Clinton a close race on that. Charm. He charms to the hilt. And it's going to be a man that's charming. The man of sin has to be revealed. Revealed is the word apocalypto. It means a removal of the cover. He has to be exposed for who he is. Now, if that was a pre-trib rapture, and he's revealed at the beginning, all these pre-trib rapture people say, the man of sin is going to be revealed. He's going to come on the scene, and the newspaper are going to say, Antichrist arrives on the scene. Yeah, that's really going to fool a lot of people, isn't it? Man of sin comes on the scene. No, no. He's going to look like this wonderful world leader. He won't be exposed for who he is. He'll be exposed by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. By this coming. He has to be revealed or exposed at the end of time for what he is as the man of sin. Let's continue reading. Let me open up my other Bible. All right. All right, now, let's continue reading. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, so many of these pre-trib rapturists, they say, see... That's the abomination of desolation when he causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease in the middle of the tribulation. It can't be a future event. It can't be because. Let me give you this. Because. When you see the word opposeth, exalteth, sit, uh, opposeth, exalteth, and showing. Those are all participles. A participle is a verbal adjective. It's an, a an adjective is a modifier of a noun or a pronoun. It modifies the man of sin. This is the opposing man of sin, the exalting man of sin, the showing himself man of sin that he's God. Participles, when they are verbal adjectives, an adjective is a modifying word. The blue bird. Blue is an adjective. The is an adjective. Adjectives tell which, what kind of, on how many. Now, when you have a verbal adjective, since it's a verb showing motion, a motion has been taken, it has tense. Present, future, past tense. Well, blue tells what kind of a bird it is. This tells what kind of a bird, or which bird. Which bird is the bird. Blue tells what kind of, so it tells which, what kind of, or how many. And adjectives modifies nouns and pronouns. And this is talking about the man of sin. So this is the this is the opposing man of sin, the exalting man of sin, and the showing man of sin. 
opposeth, exalteth, and showing are all present tense participles. That means when Paul wrote these words that he was talking about presently the man of sin was already sitting in the temple of God. What's the temple of God? We are. We're the temple. No, you're not that your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is that the church was already beginning to fall away and put down their daily cross. In when Paul is writing this. The church became apostate early on. And then when you see the word sitteth, that is an infinitive. An infinitive is a noun, and it is a verbal noun. Being a verbal, coming from a verb, having verbal character, it also has tense, and it is also present tense. This cannot possibly be in the middle of the tribulation at the end of time. It's what was going on right then and there, Paul said. Now, you can deal with that if you want to, Jack Van Impey. <laughs> Wren and Stimpy Van Impey, I like that. <laughs> he, he reads this and says, And this shows that the man of sin is going to rise up in the temple of God in Jerusalem in the future uh, when they build the temple uh, over in Jerusalem. No, you knucklehead. Read it. Get your Greek book out if you know anything about it. I don't think he does. All right, remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now you know what withholdeth. Boy, that's important to find that word because people don't have any idea what that means. Kateko. Remember I said the word echo means to hold. Huh? And it comes from echo and kata. Kata means down or with intensity. So he's saying, now you know what is holding the church down and keeping the church from going out to meet the Lord in the air in verse 1 where it says, our gathering together in the air unto him. Or as the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians says, When we go out to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now you know what's holding the church down. The apostasy has already begun, but the man of sin has not been revealed. If if this was future action, opposeth, exalteth, sitteth and showing, if that was a future action, it would be showing that he was being exposed then. But he wasn't being exposed even in the first century. He was sitting in the temple of God and the church was deceived and fooled and falling away from the truth. He says, now you know what holds the church down that he might be revealed in his time. Now you know what the, what's holding the church down and keeping us from being gathered together unto him so that the man of sin will be revealed, apocalypto, And the cover will be taken off in his time. And then he says something that's very important. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. He's saying the putting down of the cross is already going on in the first century. They were already abandoning the daily cross in the first century when Paul wrote this. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let. The word letteth is the word kateko, hold down. Only he who holds down the church will hold down until the man of sin be taken out of the way. Until he's exposed for what he is. Now we know what holds the church down and keeps us from being taken out in the air. The man of sin has to be exposed for who he is. 
He has to be revealed, but that happens at the coming of the Lord. Let's continue to read. Now we know what letteth or what holds the church down from being gathered together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Something holds the church down. The apostasy is already here. The people want to remove all controversy. They want to get along, don't they? And that word stasis also means controversy. They want to remove that. And when you and I start telling truth, controversy rises, doesn't it? And they crucify us for it. See, controversy and the cross are the same thing in this case. Right? Men crucify us for the controversy that we cause with the truth. He says, now you know what holds the church down until he be taken out of the way. And when he's taken out of the way, then shall that wicked be revealed. The cover will be taken off, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What is that brightness? Matthew 24, 27 as the lightning shines from the east to the west. That 19th chapter of Revelation, eyes is a flame of fire. That first chapter of Second Thessalonians, when in flaming fire taking vengeance on all them that know not God, then obey not the gospel. We're talking about something that's about to happen. I believe in the very not too distant future. And then shall that wicked man of sin, it's talking about the man of sin, isn't it? Back to verse 3, where two things have to happen, the falling away first, and the man of sin being revealed as the son of perdition. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the epiphania, brightness, P-H. A-N-E-I-A. Epiphania. It comes from epi and phanos. It means to cover with or superimpose the shining. The Lord is going to expose Satan with the shining or the brightness of his coming. And that's when it will be destroyed. And that's when he comes back in flaming fire at the last trump, at the seventh trump. And will be changed and he'll destroy all of his enemies at that time. Right? I don't know why men don't bother to look these words up. If you look up the words, you know how many preachers I've heard talk about withholdeth. Now we know what withholdeth. We know what restrains. And they got all these, uh, the devil restrains. No, God holds the church down. It's God that's going to expose Satan. That's what holds the church down and keeps him from going up to meet the Lord in the air, isn't it? Two things have to happen. The removal of the cross, the removal of controversy, this compromise that's going on in the world that's called political correctness. And when the Roman Catholic Church started, they issued an edict of toleration throughout the world, didn't they? Everybody, let's all get along and hold hands. No. We're not supposed to get along with the world. Friends with the world are enemies of God. How much time, Mike? Let's look at that man of sin over in Daniel, the 8th chapter. Daniel 8. Did I finish that? Oh, let me, let me finish that. Let me finish reading that. Let's go to Daniel 8. Daniel 8. Shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The man of sin is the head of the world system. It is Pontifex Maximus, but this has evolved out of Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then into the, uh, the Roman Empire was outlawed. That's the deadly wound that was healed of one of the heads. And the heads were seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And the Roman Empire was outlawed and reinstituted in the form. And a mountain was the capital city of an empire. And that was outlawed and reinstituted in the form of Roman Catholicism. And now Roman Catholicism has branched out into tolerance and toleration and just everything goes. It's not, Roman Catholicism doesn't come with Roman Catholicism written over men's heads. That's not what, how it comes. It comes saying, let's all get along. Let's all be nice to each other. Let's tolerate one another. Let's uh, 
There's no need in talking to people about a David Cross. We live in a modern world where everybody, we're all a bunch of sophisticated people, and we don't need that, you know. We can, just a bunch of baloney. Let's agree not to disagree. Yeah, yeah, we, we agree not, yeah. I want to agree to call them down and confess Christ. <laughs> all right, now go over here to the, go over here to the, to the eighth chapter of Daniel. We're talking about, a ram with two horns in the first part of the chapter. And the ram with two horns is Persia. It's Persia. And the scripture tells us it's Persia. And it's reason it's got two horns. It's a dual empire. It's Persia and the Mede Empire. And the Medes. Persia slash Mede Empire. It's a two horn. Uh, I don't have time to go through all this. I'll read verse 3. Daniel is on the river Uli. Then I lifted up mine eyes in verse 3. And behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, and one was higher than the other. That's because Persia was more powerful than the Mede Empire. And the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, and Persia was... He ran over to Afghanistan and Pakistan and over to all the nations over to India. That was Persia. Iraq was Babylon. And the ancient world, well, isn't it amazing we got all this going on? And I was considering, behold, in verse 5, and he go came from the west, Alexander the Great, that's who it's talking about, the Greeks, and he's going to overthrow the Persian Empire. And he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had notable horn between his eyes. And the notable horn is Alexander the Great. And he came to the ram that had two horns which had been standing before the river and ran into him with fury of his power. And he conquered him. And I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with choler to be bitter or to be grieved, vexed towards him. And to break his two horns of the Persians and the Mede. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast down the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. For it had come up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. That's the four generals that took over Alexander the Great's empire. I don't have time to go into that. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south, and that was Antiochus Epiphanes trying to attack Egypt and then desecrating the temple, and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Let me jump on down here because I'm running out of time. Verse 20, interpretation. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. You thought I was guessing, didn't you? All you got to do is read it. And the rough goat is the king of Greece. That's Alexander the Great that overthrew the two-horned lamb. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. That's Alexander the Great. Now that being broken, wherefore four stood up. That's the four generals, Cassander, Lysacomus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. They took over Alexander's empire. Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, jump to the end of time. Their kingdom is Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, Roman Catholicism, the beast world system. And at the end of their kingdom is the end of time, isn't it? That's the beast that's going to be destroyed in Revelation, the, uh, 20, uh, the, the 19th chapter when he's cast into the lake of fire. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, when they've done all the transgression that God will allow them to do, all the sin, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. The word dark sentences is the word kidah. C-H-I-Y-D-A-H. C-H-I-Y-D-A-H. Dark sentences means puzzling questions what are the puzzling questions how about no remedy questions there'll be distress of nations 
with perplexity, men's hearts failing you for fear, for looking after the things coming on the earth, the sea and the waves roaring. Perplexity means no remedy, aporia. What, is those, what, is, what are those questions? The sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. There in Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter, when God said, there will be no cure, marpe is the word, no remedy. For my four judgments, the sword, the famine. What's the problem with the world? Famine, we don't have enough food over the world. Sword, war everywhere. Pestilence, disease of all kinds. The economy is running crazy. America owes $9 trillion. Impossible to ever pay it off. No way. In 1992, according to Larry Burkett, when we had a trillion dollar national debt, every man, woman, and child owed, in America owed $300,000 apiece. I don't know how, boy, you talk about more than that. We owe $9 trillion. <laughs> What are we going to do? Nothing. There will be no answer until Jesus comes. And there arises a king of fierce countenance says, I've got the answers and he's going to be a charming man and he's going to charm the world. And I keep looking. Bill Clinton keeps saying he wants to be Secretary General of the United Nations. He keeps pushing for that. He keeps pushing Hillary. He wants to stand the spotlight. I don't know if it's him. It's going to be somebody like him. Let's go on and read this. <coughs> Here's the king of fierce countenance. It's the same thing as the man of sin. <clears throat> and he's going to have to be revealed because he's going to claim to have the problems are going to be solved. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully. It's going to look like a wonderful thing when he destroys the earth. And shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and holy people. And through his policy, C-K-L, S-E-K-E-L, intelligence, brilliance, he shall cause craft, Mirma, M-I-R-M-A-H, to prosper, deception. He'll be so smart that he can be devious and underhanded and he'll cause that deviousness to prosper. Bill Clinton could do anything when he was in office. I'm not saying it's Bill Clinton, but it'll be somebody like him. He could do anything. Chase women, carouse, carry on, have affairs. And America loved him anyway. They still love him. If he would, could run for office, they would elect him. Do you know that? He is one of the most charming, soft-spoken guys. People don't know what he's really like. In his, first, in his first run for presidency, when he got the presidency, I saw him in, a, in one of his campaigns, and he was out there, and he turned around and said to some guy, that GDSOB, you stop him. And I'm thinking, hey, that's the picture we want. Yeah. We're, this is the man of sin. He'll cause, by his intelligence, he'll call craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. And remember, this is in the latter time of this kingdom. That's the beast world system at the end of time. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's Jesus Christ. And the world is going to attack Christ. And how do you attack a man? You attack his wife. The church is going to be under attack. And he shall be broken without hand, without strength. That means without any strength. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. The man of sin, the king of fierce countenance, will be revealed. And when he's exposed, but first of all, he's going to have to come forward. And there's got to be world problems that can't be solved. Do we have any world problems that can't be solved? There is no... We can't solve war. We can't even declare war anymore. Did you know that? Since World War II, we have not been able to declare war with all the trade agreements with this country, trading with this country. If we declare war with this country, they won't be able to buy from this country. That, so we sell wheat to over here. We sell something else to. And so we can't declare war. We call it 
police action in Korea. We called it advisors in Vietnam. In Vietnam. Advisors? All these guys are dead. 100,000 soldiers are dead and it's advisors? They had to come up with a term if we had declared war in Korea in, against North Korea when they came across the 38th parallel in 1950. We'd have had to take on Russia and China. If we declare war now, that's why I say, if Mr. Netanyahu says they're going to attack Iran and they get past Iraq, if they have to fly around, they get past, they will, all hell's going to break loose in the world. This is not something to be sloughed off and laughed at. We're looking eternity in the face. And people are acting like, oh, well, I don't think it'll ever happen because it never has. I don't think I'll never die because I never did. Yeah. Yeah, we can't, can we? Well, that's, that's all I got to say tonight. It's not all I want to say, but it's all I need to say. I'm out of time. Well, I'll, take, I'll do this next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Cause us to continue this message. Lord, frighten us down to our toes because we have to be frightened of you in order to belong to you. The world is not scared of you. When we're frightened, that certainly is proof of our belief in you. We believe that you're going to do the things that you say you're going to do. Crush us under your hand. You said we have to be crushed if we belong to you. Crush this old self out of us. Cause us to live godly and righteously and holy before you. God will continue to praise you and give you thanks for all things. Lead us to your elect and give those that have come here for this annual picnic. Give them strength to continue in the word. and Take them back home and strengthen them, Lord. Cause them to get into the word and read and listen to the DVDs and watch the videos and listen to the tapes and get strong in truth that we may continue to gather together and get this message out. We pray that you'll open up many doors for this ministry. Be with our meeting with the TV people tomorrow and we'll give you praise for everything in Christ's name. Amen. amen. We covered the whole spectrum tonight. Well, I'll tell you, we do, don't we? It's kind of scary, isn't it? He's funny, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he didn't, did he? Well, one. <laughs> well, it's scary, but somebody's going to come up, rise up, and say, "I got the answers." How long is what? I don't know. About four years, I think. About like America, I think. But he, if he runs again and they elect him, they're going to war. He says. He want to run. Huh? Yeah, he want. Yeah, he wants to attack Iran. He's. He don't want America. Huh? Not America, but uh, Iran don't want him. They don't want to, uh, Iran don't want to destroy Israel too. Yes, they Iran want to. Iran want them much, as bad as he want Iran, don't they? Well, they want. They want to destroy America and Israel. They want to destroy Great Britain, America, and Israel, because America and Great Britain were behind the petition of that land taking it away from the Palestinian Arabs in 1948. Not now, he was. But when they run, there's, a, there's an election coming up and if he becomes Prime Minister again, he says he is going to attack Iran with nuclear power. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Russia's going to get involved and we're going to get involved. World War then. World War III. They want to destroy Iran because Iran is threatening to destroy them. He says when he gets nuclear power, he's attacking Israel with it. Netanyahu says that he is about, Amani Dajad is just a couple of years away from it or 18 months away from getting that, maybe sooner. He said we have to attack them very soon with nuclear warheads. 
in Great Britain. Great Britain. What's their defense? What's their defense mechanism? What's their defense stance on on, on the standpoint? What's their defense? What are they saying? Well, they don't have any defense at all to speak of. That's why they keep blowing up their their tunnels and their causeways over there. They're over there blowing them up because it was Great Britain and America that was behind the petitioning of the land. And Netanyahu says, and because they took that land and put the Palestinian Arabs in the, in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and they took the land away from the Palestinian Arabs, all the Arabs are brothers. And he says, and he really believes he's doing a right thing going and getting this land back that was taken away from his brothers. And he says he's going to blow Israel off the face of the earth. If they don't attack them, they will be blown up. Right. And in the meantime, he, 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 he wants us to don't. Huh? He wants he want, he want to... Uh, Amadi Dajad wants to come over here and bring nuclear bombs into America and bring them across the borders, and some of them are probably already here. I did a messages on the nuclear suitcases, and they say they are already got nuclear power here. He want to... He, well, he, is he making any physical threats to America right now? Yes. That's he calls America the he calls America the great Satan. Are you kidding? He hates us. How long has it been? I know he had some reason. You got to understand, Taliban and Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is a. They're sending Al Qaeda over here. They're coming in here, and that's a terrorist organization. They're the ones that's killing off the Americans over there. People don't know how serious this is. No, that don't go there. Take that over there. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. You talked about the uh, tribulation and you were saying that the time, time, time and a half. And it wasn't last yeah, time, time and a half at times is three and a half years. Are those true elect believers that are going to be persecuted? Well, yeah. That's the only ones that are going to be persecuted. So that would mean there should be an acceleration of the amount of people who are true believers then toward the end of time. Well, it's only going to be few. It's going to be few, right? But what God's going to do is call his people out of this Babylonian system. Right. And the ones that can hear will come out. Okay. But I don't know who that is. It's, I don't, I don't, it's it sounded like it was going to be... There's not going to be a lot. More than, more than what we currently have. Yeah, but it's not going to be a lot. Jesus said few will find the narrow gate. This is a scary thing, and it's happening before our very eyes. Oh, I know. What I told you, what I talked to you about? 2001. Yeah. 2001. Was about We're headed towards some bad, bad things. Jim, let me ask you a question. When uh, Israel you. was scattered and taken over to Babylon, oh, okay. and only less than 50,000 came back when they were, you know. Less than 50, right, yeah. Less than 50. Or could be Jewish descent. Well, Jews have mixed with all the nations of the world. They have mixed. Well, it could be. But it doesn't matter. The Jew is of the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. You know what I meant. I meant Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I got one here. I forgot. I forgot. I didn't want you to lose it. Well, thank you, Jim, for everything. Thank you. Okay, thank you, my. Tomorrow morning. Let me leave this here. Oh. I was working over at Vanderbilt when the first Gulf War happened and a bunch of kids were doing it. I guess I better go to church now. I said, no sense of going if you ain't never been. Yeah, ain't going to help now. It don't help if you don't believe. That's right, Richard. Exactly true. Exactly. Have you ever um, looked in Gray's Anatomy under stomach? Under what? The stomach. I've looked some at it. Let me get my st Where's my stuff? Oh, there it is. He Hold on a second. Let me stick that in there. Wait a minute. Is that everything?
I guess that's all. Let me make sure. Hold on a second. Hey. hey how you doing? What are you doing, little guy? What's going on? Oh, you know, same old thing? Same six and seven? Yeah. Are you mad, at, mad at the world still. So well, you, you kind of stay that way, don't yeah. you? <laughs>